Good afternoon, Your Highness, Your Excellency. Thank you for joining us again in the auditorium today. Um, the power of photography is all around us, as we can see in, uh, in all the exhibitions, but uh, there's also the power of photography to influence things, change things. It has long been associated with the idea of capturing reality or capturing a specific place, an object, a person, a moment. And, uh, but while our planet suffers from the effect of climate change and global warming, photography can also play a key role in preserving and documenting the world around us, as well as bringing attention through visual communication to targeted, to targeted climate and social issues in order to educate and inspire real change. Today we have a panel led by Elia Locardi, an internationally acclaimed professional travel photographer, writer, experienced public speaker and highly skilled educator who spends his life shooting some of the most beautiful locations in the world. He's joined by Chris Rainier, the director of the Cultural Sanctuaries Foundation. QT Long, Luong celebrates the nat natural and human heritage with his photography. Jordan Hammond launched an online course on business and a mentorship program where he teaches his students. And Luri Belagurshi is an internationally acclaimed nature photographer with a passion for the outdoors in the Arctic region. And finally also Daniel Gordon, a landscape and travel photographer from Russia and a partner in an Iceland photo tours company. They're here to talk about the power of photography, what it can do and what it can change. Uh, give them a big applause. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to the panel for joining us here and agreeing to uh, be victims of my questions. This is gonna be really fun. So I wanna start today just by introducing a little bit about us and a little bit about what we're gonna talk about. So I'm hosting, my name's Eli Locardi. I'm a world travel photographer, an extremely caffeinated frequent flyer and occasional, uh, you know, writer and speaker. But these guys are gonna be really fun to talk to. So sitting conveniently in the same way that I ordered it on screen, we have Chris Rainier, Chris, Daniel Corden, QT Long, and George Hammond. It's good to have you guys here. Give a round of applause for them all making it. I'm excited about this. So let's start with some introductions. I'm just gonna briefly read these bios here and then I wanna hear from them themselves. So Chris Rainier is the director of the Cultural Sanctuaries Foundation, a global program focused on preserving both biodiversity and cultural heritage. The mission of the foundation is protecting traditional cultures on their land they can better protect the biodiversity and wilderness, which is one of the front lines of climate change. Photography plays a crucial role in empowering traditional societies, creating opportunities for indigenous communities to tell the story of climate issues firsthand. So Chris, I'm really happy to have you here. Can you just give a, a, a more personal introduction to, to yourself and your work? Well, thank you, uh, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Your Highness, for having us and sponsoring this remarkable, remarkable world-class photo festival. So um, I really began photography as a very young person, and I had the opportunity, uh, because of my father's uh, job, to travel to many indigenous cultures, including growing up in Australia. And what I began to see was things weren't that well for indigenous cultures. There's a, a, a massive collapse of language and culture around the world. So um, I think I mentioned in the opening ceremony that I worked for Ansel Adams and he really inspired me as a photographic artist. Steve talked about this last night, that wonderful um, a uh, combination of art and social justice. So I really uh, hit the road and I haven't 
quite got off it yet in terms of using photography as a social tool. And so I'm really driven by that mission and driven by empowering underrepresented indigenous photographers around the, the world and empowering them to share the stories through photography. Thank you. And this is just a sampling of the most incredible work. I did a lot of research and actually my favorite part was looking at everybody's images for this presentation. <laughs> well, next up, we have Daniel Corden. It's time to put you on the spot a little bit, Daniel. Daniel is a landscape and travel photographer from Russia, partner in Iceland Photo Tours, the largest photo tour company in the world, uh, owner of the Instagram account, Daniel Corden, with 1.5 million followers. Nikon, Gitzo, and Skyloom, global ambassadorships. Daniel spends 10 months of the year traveling the world and capturing breathtaking landscapes. Thank you for introduction, Elia, and dear guests, uh, your highness. Thank you for coming here and listening for this panel session. So I'm also coming here a second time on exposure, this time with a bit uh, different exposition. This time is also about uh, cultures, about indigenous people of uh, Russia. So a bit of snow and cold in uh, warm Dubai, finally, from Russia with love. And uh, my journey into the cultures it started about uh, three years ago when I first uh, uh, started to be uh, staying with local families and uh, understanding also the beauty of, of uh, the small cultures around the world. So since then, I really uh, tried to go deeper into the project and uh, document cultures not about uh, just Russian indigenous people and also around the world, including Kenya, including uh, also Mongolia, so a lot of uh, pictures now that I make, uh, that's projects that I make, it's about cultures and about people. So happy to discuss uh, this topic today. Thanks. Next up, we have QT Luang. He was the first to photograph all America's 62 national parks in large format. He received the National Parks Conservation Association's Robin W. Winks Award for Enhancing Public Understanding of National Parks and was featured in the film, The National Parks, America's Best Idea. His photographs are extensively published and have been the subject of large format books including Treasured Lands, winner of 12 national and international book awards, many newspaper mag magazine feature articles, solo galleries, and museum exhibits across the US and abroad. So needless to say, he's been uh, just a little busy. Thank you, Ilya, for this nice introduction. Thank you to, to all of you for coming today. So I, I was actually quite an unlike, unlikely person to have photographed the national parks. I was born in France and I grew up as a city kid. But when, when I came to the US, I really felt in love with the, the diversity of the national parks. I just wanted first to visit them for myself. But that adventure was incredible and brought me so much joy. So I wanted to share with others um, what I've seen and inspire them to uh, to experience for themselves what, what I experience. And so this is why I, I started to um, uh, try to um, communicate, communicate to, to others the, the, the value of, of those places. So my, the, the goal of my photography has been to, to teach other people the value of wild places and in particular of um, or public lands in America. So I started a new project uh, just four years ago when uh, an executive order threatened uh, the national monuments, which are another class of public lands in the US. And so those lands are less known than the national parks. And I saw that they, they, def they deserve more awareness. So that was my, my last project um, about the national monuments. Thank you. And we also have Jord Hammond. <laughs> Jord is a freelance travel photographer and storyteller from Dover, UK. At just 26 years old, he has become well known on social media for his modern style of photography, 
mixing diverse cultures, color, light, and landscapes as he travels throughout Asia. George's photo George photography journey began in 2015 when he moved to China to teach English after graduating with a marketing and advertising bachelor's in the UK. Hello. Thank you for that generous introduction. I'm actually yeah, 28 years old now, and that photo is actually five years uh, old. I was, so was going to Very ask. generous, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for, for coming to this talk, and Your Highness, thanks for organizing the event. Um, so yeah, I got into photography, I think, about, about six years ago now. Um, it's actually when I moved out to, to China to start teaching English, and photography kind of became my escape from teaching English. Um, and over that, that year of teaching, I, I slowly came to the conclusion that this is what I wanted to do full time. So I eventually left my, my teaching job after 12 months and just decided to pursue uh, travel photography full time. Um, and I guess today we're gonna be talking a little bit more about the impact of photography. And so over the past 12 months or so, I've kind of transitioned from more, I'd say like influencer based kind of work into impact photography focused on agricultural life and work uh, in Bali, Java, and Lombok in Indonesia. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, I definitely want to talk more about that too. So the, the topic of this is the power of photography, and that means something different to all of us, and I've thought a lot about it, you know, whether we are trying to bring attention to species preservation or we're trying to save a landscape that's being destroyed, whether of natural or human causes, it's extremely important. And images have the power to captivate, to invigorate, and to inspire. And I think it means something a little bit different. And we have a, a great diversity here on the panel in terms of images. Uh, Chris, I kind of want to lead it off with you. What, what do you feel this means to you? What is, the, what is the true power of photography? Well, thank you for the question. I think photography is a very powerful weapon of choice. It is a medium that people are well versed at. Now six billion uh, images a day are loaded up onto the internet. Instagram, multiple different sites. Um, people, this is a, a common language now around the world, the democratization of storytelling. So we have an opportunity to uh, influence through photography. And my niche, as, as I think people now know, is culture. So it's not wildlife. Yes, I do landscape photographs. That happens to be one of them right there. And certainly my mentor, Ansel Adams, used the power of photography to, to help protect national parks. But I think the crucial thing I want to say is just by taking the images is not enough. You need to create a platform, uh, whether it is Instagram uh, or social media or some way to influence people. Again, the story that I illustrated the other day is National, uh, Ansel Adams would take his portfolio under his arm in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s and 60s, and even when I worked with him in the 1980s, under his arm and he would bang on the White House in Washington, D.C., or Congress. And it was his influence that helped actually stop the damming of the Grand Canyon. They were, were in the process of putting that into emotion. So photography is a powerful medium, but by just putting it out on Instagram is not enough. You need to uh, you know, get a hold of your congressman. You need to get a hold of whoever is making those uh, decisions and I believe, certainly in landscape photography and even wildlife photography, you look at Joel's amazing photo arc work, um, Steve's documentation of landscape, the affirmation of beauty, giving people hope that their, their influence, their love of culture and biodiversity and wildlife landscape will make a difference. So put, Photography has a powerful place in today's language of change. That's, that's actually a great answer. And you brought up something really interesting. You, you spoke about Ansel Adams and the period of time that he was working. Obviously, he didn't have Instagram. Right. But, he, but he was knocking on the White House door, which I can just, I, I wish I was able to see yes. that today. But if photography, if we've been using photography to inspire, captivate for more than 180 years now on record, 
Photography hasn't changed in its intention, but certainly the technology and our delivery of photography has changed a lot. So I was curious about that because you brought up Instagram. Uh, George, I was curious about this because I feel like with this kind of visual storytelling, you start with the intention. Your intention is to capture this, to tell the story of this, but then it becomes about the attention for it. And, and certainly there are some new ways of getting attention for it and has evolved. Do you feel that that has been a positive play to, to be able to sort of use that audience to get them to sort of have a call to action to, for change? Yeah, I guess so. Um, I, I suppose it depends on, on how you use social media, right? Like, like kind of Chris was saying, it's not enough to just share it on social media, be it Instagram, Twitter, or you know, other social media platforms. But um, yeah, I think, I think really for me, like Instagram's been a wonderful tool to be able to share my message and to try and inspire change. I mean, particularly over the last couple of years in, in, in Bali, for example, um, where you know, tourism has gone from, let's say around 6 million people in, uh, I think, 2019, down to you know, less than 100,000 in 2020 and down to zero, effectively, in 2021. Yeah, so. so do you think as, and, and Chris, you mentioned this too, that <clears throat> photography has certainly evolved. Now we have so many, you know, millions of photos are just being uploaded every day. Our access to be able to shoot cameras and shoot amazing photos from uh, mobile devices and phones and, and just flood the world with these images. It's kind of a, a positive and negative. I feel like as we're doing this, we, we can also create a lot of noise. And maybe that in some ways with some of these photos, it's harder to get them to stick out. You know, I, I can do a, a pretty landscape or, you know, a, a kitten photo. And, and I know that's going to get a lot of attention. But sometimes I feel like the most important, the most powerful work that inspires me, it doesn't really grab that 15 seconds of time. So Daniel, how do, you, how do you then pull somebody in? You get them, you have to work on it a little bit harder, you have to get them in. How do you get them to read? How do you get them to do something? Uh, well, uh, yeah, I'm not actually really happy about recent changes with social media, like the reels and so on, but this is, uh, the world is changing with information, right? We consume more and more, but uh, still myself, I prefer to work on some solid projects. The project will, that can tell story in whole. Yes, uh, all the 10, 15 seconds videos, they might pass, but still people will remember you for something bigger as well. <clears throat> and I always think about photography like about uh, therapy as well. Let's say my wife, she's uh, doing art therapy, and uh, well, we <laughs> realized at some point that uh, landscape and nature photography, it's not different from art therapy. So when the person sees a beautiful landscape, especially in these hard times of pandemic of COVID, it just uh, calms him down and, uh, well, he realizes that he can go out in the nature, he can be just not locked down in his apartment, his flat, right? And uh, this is it. Uh, maybe some videos can uh, bring this feel, but not for me. For me, it's all about photography that you can just watch calmly for five minutes, 10 minutes, some beautiful landscape, but all the videos and uh, everything just making a visual noise at some point. Okay, yeah, that's a, you know, and that, that angle of the power of photography is, it, it is a really great experiential thing. It does get people to leave the comfort of their home to try to go a little bit further. In the beginning, maybe you're on the tourist track, but then you want to discover more and you learn more. So from a therapeutic aspect, I, I also know that this is kind of leading. So QT, I, I want to change up the question for you a little bit uh, because I have one of your beautiful images on here. And it, it kind of goes back to that intention versus attention, right? We, we all start somewhere, there's, there's a different point when we realize we, we, an audience, it could be something as simple as uh, people see the photo and they're like, wow, I, I didn't know that that was an issue. You start to recognize the power. But how did you get started? And when did you realize how powerful your images could be? Um, well, um, what, what really got me started in, uh, in photography was that uh, um, I, I grew up as, um, as a city kid, as I mentioned. And 
in my early 20s, friends took me up high, up the, the high peaks of the Alps. And uh, um, that, I, I wasn't born with a desire to, to depict the, the world with a camera, but back then, but back then, when I when when I saw the beauty on on those high peaks, um, I wanted to bring that back to to friends and family who couldn't get there, the, the wonders of, of what uh, I saw there, and so that's what inspired me to to, to take photography, and uh, in turn, after when I when when I went around and I, I gave slideshow, other people started. To, to be interested in the mountain, wanted to, to join um, an alpine club, wanted to, to start climbing too. And so that's right from the start that, that I, I realized that um, the photographs had the power to, to inspire people to, to see the, the places for themselves. Because one of the things which is very precious about photography is that unlike the other arts, it has a direct connection with the world. And this is, um, this is a bond which is, which is very precious and that we, we should make sure to, to preserve in the, in the digital age, not by um, passing manipulations for photographs. Um, so when people uh, um, see places in, in photograph, I, I just beautiful places in photograph, often their, their first reaction is that they, they just want to go there. And that's, that's how conservation starts, because people, um, people um, conserve the place that they love, and the place they love are the place they've developed a connection with. And the, the places that they've developed a connection with are the places they've been to. And so Photography has the power to, to set emotions that chain of events. Yeah, that's a great answer. I, I, I feel that too, and it, it really comes across with your work, the authenticity and the scope of what you're able to capture, and this is really important. And I think, and that's kind of the seed of somebody seeing these images, let's say the national parks, and then wanting to visit, and then understanding the beauty and, and maybe getting a little bit more education about the preservation and then understanding that these are, are heritage sites. Especially in, in North America, we, have, you know, we don't have hundreds and hundreds of years of history, but these landscapes are something that we need to preserve for future generations. And it, it kind of makes me think too, it, it, for me, example, I, I, did, I wanted to take some pretty photos and then kind of transformed into wanting to change. And Chris, you know, is there, was there like some specific moment in your career? Did Ansel hit you over the head with something? Was somebody, push you or was there a project where, where something emotionally just struck a chord with you? Is there a point where you remember that you were going to go really further into this? Yeah, and I, I want to answer kind of two, two questions here, but yes, very definitely, and it was no question at a certain point working for Ansel Adams, but I, I also grew up in England and had a, a remarkable great aunt who was um, a very well-known composer and her kind of saloon of friends was Benjamin Britten, Henry Moore, and all these great social thinkers and artists of the 20th century. And she would have these gatherings on a Sunday. And at a very young age, I was sort of in the midst of this intellectual kind of fervor of the responsibility of whatever art form you choose of um, using it as a powerful tool. So I was very kind of energized at an early um, age to, to uh, pick up a medium and it ended up being photography as a social tool. One of the things I also wanted to say is that I think especially in this time of Instagram, all of us have a responsibility that these ecosystems, where they're, whether they're wilderness or wildlife or certainly cultural places, if you're posting and suddenly you've got millions of people aware of that place, we have a responsibility to take into account the culture that we're dealing with. I remember doing an assignment and being sent by a well-known magazine to New Guinea and I asked them not to include a map of where we had been and they did and I have 
on my hands the guilt of realizing uh, it changed that village forever. Now people go there on a regular basis. So I think the back end of all of this is that we have a responsibility to, if we're going to use our photography, be a part of the solution and not the problem. That's an excellent point, and it actually leads into the next slide, but I, I kind of want to hear a little bit about this too. Um, actually, from Jord, I, I really want to know what, what it was for you. What, what did it? Was, it? was it being in Asia? Was it being in a specific place where you just, you decided you want to show the resilience of the people? You, you, just, you really felt this call to capture this? <clears throat> yeah, so I took, a, I think, a turn in my work when the... <clears throat> Sorry. When the COVID pandemic came around, I pretty much lost all of my work, travel-related work anyway, as I'm sure most other photographers and you know, travel-related workers did. Um, and so I decided to, you know, I would stay in Indonesia. It was either I stay in Indonesia or I go back to the UK. And I thought, well, I'd much rather stay here, so I'll do that. Um, but it also dawned on me that, you know, it wasn't just me that was losing, you know, kind of my way of life or... You know, maybe I was having some kind of identity crisis, I don't know, but um, I decided that I needed to dive deeper for once on, on one certain topic or one certain area of the world, and so I thought, well, maybe what better place to do it than Bali, Indonesia, right? Like, it's, it was growing in popularity. I think, as I mentioned earlier, there were probably two million visitors in 2011, uh, up to six and a half million in 2019, projected to, you know, grow by millions every year. Um, and, and I wanted to find a way of capturing the island a little differently um, to the way in which I'd seen it before. And <clears throat> I thought, I actually just came through the, the simple act actually of paying more attention to my surroundings. And a lot of the things I was actually started to photograph um, revolved around agricultural work and life. Um, but these things are, you know, like omnipresent in Bali. They're, they're absolutely all around you, but oftentimes they're things you would just pass on the way to a famous destination, to a waterfall or to a volcano or something like that. And once I immerse myself in those kinds of experiences, uh, you know, I start to have conversations with these people and, and you start to realize that their lives have been totally turned around as well. So where their lives revolved around tourism, hospitality work in like bigger resorts, hotels, restaurants, places like that in the south of the island, uh, they then had to return home uh, to their home villages um, and back to agricultural work and I kind of found that um, in, in a strange way like me and the people that I was meeting had far more in common than I'd probably first imagined yeah and so that's what inspired me to I think just you know on one hand to to capture their lives and how they changed but also just to you know perhaps for myself just to capture something different and yeah it's been an it's been an incredible process like, that's great. That's great. Yeah, it kind of evolves as you go. But I think you have to be mm. a curious pers person in, in general. Like, you really want to get those stories. And when you spend time places, you can discover them. Um, and I think that tourist mentality of just getting in and seeing stuff and having the surface is, is something that, that none of us here do. We, we want to talk to the people. We want to understand. We want to get involved if we can. We have a probably tendency to fall in love with locations a little bit too much, and wanting <laughs> to do things. It's not a bad thing. Yeah. It's, it's probably bad for our travel budget, but that's okay. So I want to dovetail into the next topic, but before I do that, Daniel, so your photos of the landscapes are amazing, right? And, and it's par partially your fault that everything's so busy. So that's the next thing, right? Like, because there's so many people in these places now. You've inspired, you've inspired uh, some over tourism. But when did you start to want to tell stories about the indigenous people in Russia and these places? This is a completely different direction for you. Yeah, the, there are two uh, main points here. Like, so first, yes, on one hand, uh, uh, beautiful landscapes and beautiful images, then uh, they can inspire people to travel, to open the world. On the other, if you open the world to them, they can destroy the places. So all the masses, they can destroy it. So this is the part where it's essential to tell a story and educate people. So not just uh, publishing the image, giving, uh, let's say, all the coordinates to the place, let's go there, let's take the same images, but tell them the story that we must protect the place and how we must protect. So basically, all the tourism, it must be regulated. Of course, this is the idea that we need to pass to the government, to national parks, but we as photographers, we're always responsible for what we open 
the public. And we must also educate, let's say, have example uh, of the place from Indonesia and Sumba Island is a mangrove dancing trees. So I went there once and after me, also people start coming, coming there. And uh, a lot of wedding photographers, they come there and they start basically just kind of asking the models to sit on the trees, which is not correct. So I keep uh, writing these people, I keep writing in my captions as well. So guys, stop doing that. Let's protect the place. Let's try to just not ruin it. Be just observer and keep the nature alive. So this is the message we must bear. Well, and, uh, yeah, and that you perfectly segment into this next topic is the power of photography cuts both ways, right? Because that's when we can start to talk about the cost of this impact. So uh, Chris had said, I wanted to stop hiding, or I wanted to hide the map. And I think the more I, I went down to really spending time and exploring cultures and, and different things and photographing it, I started to realize that I, I'd be worried to share it. I didn't want TripAdvisor to pick it up. I, I felt like, yeah, tourism would be great, but there's something really special here. So it can be really difficult when we're sharing images because we can't just hide GPS, it's hard to find. But it depends on our work too, I think, whether you're trying to pull somebody somewhere or whether you're trying to pull awareness. George, do you think this has become a challenge where you're showing these, uh, you know, really, they're not on the tourist track destinations and people just come to take that image rather than doing anything else? They don't follow through with what you're... Yeah, it's difficult. Um, I, I think it, it can be difficult to make somebody feel so passionately about something as you do yourself, right? That, that's the challenge with it. Like, well, I wouldn't necessarily worry about people, you know, going and bothering the people that I photograph because it's taken me an entire year of driving and, and, and getting lost and taking too many wrong turns, you know, to even find my way home most of the time. But, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's certainly, you know, a, a challenge with, like, inspiring, I think, true change, like, through those photos, because I, I sometimes even wonder myself, well, although I'm, I'm trying to convey a certain story and trying to, you know, put a certain angle on this, do people even, you know, the storytelling has to be incredibly effective to, I think, actually in, in inspire change itself, right? Because most people, that, if, if like Daniel was talking earlier about Instagram Reels, right, like the attention being there and the attention span, stand, uh, span also being so short, right? Mm -hmm. So most people are kind of just flicking through like, okay, oh, that's a nice photo, I want to get that one as well. Like the amount of messages I've had over the past year asking me just where the people are that I photographed, nothing really to do with their story or, or trying to help them kind of out of these certain situations, but more so focused on perhaps a selfish greed just to capture it themselves is, yeah. I feel, I feel this is a, a challenge, right? We, we have a great opportunity with the accessibility of creating images. We can, we can almost have a, a connection, we can share stories live, we can do all of these things in, in a capacity that we couldn't before. But that can also cause some issues. Um, and, I, and I think that the biggest challenge is Obviously recognizing first somebody has the desire to take photos. Oh, you're, you're taking photos with the phone But then it becomes what are you going to do with these photos? And I think that the the latest culture is yeah, we're going to post them to social media We're going to do this, but I think that it's it's nice to see some of these images like seeing Daniel's recent work has kind of validated some things that I wanted to do Because uh, we can kind of get stuck in what works you know, I can do what I'm doing because I know it's going to work and it makes me worried to jump out and do something else that's, that's important. And I think, uh, QT, has that been difficult for you, being so well known for national parks and, and so focused on, on this cataloging and collecting? Has it, has it created, and we talk about the cost of impact, has this, has this been hard? Has it been hard to break out of that mode or is it easy to, to get stuck in it? Well, 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 I think first, um, uh, the, the previous panelists have, have been talking a lot about social media, but it's, uh, it's not my primary mode of communication. And uh, I'm, I'm, still pretty, I'm still very old-fashioned. And for me, the, um, the preferred medium for, for sharing photographs is, is a book. Uh, the, 
the book lasts last a long time. They pass through generations, you know, and, uh, and it's not something that where you, you just have a quick glance at the picture and then you, you scroll to the next five seconds later and then you, you forget it. It is, it is something that you, that you, you sit, you sit with, you, you engage, you're going to, you're going to, to, to read the entire book at one point. And so that, me, that means that not only you're going to, 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 to look at the photograph, but you're, you're, going to, you're going to read the text too. And that, that's where the, the opportunity for, for education comes. And for instance, for in, in, my last, in, my, in my last project, indeed, there was um, this um, conundrum, the should, should, which, which places should I um, publicize? Which places should I keep um, uh, hidden? Because uh, they, they don't take the, the increased impact. And in, in that project, I, I worked with uh, conservation organizations. For, for each of the nation monuments that were depicted in the book, I work with one specific organization. Uh, friends organization, people who, who care for those places, who were in many times instrumental in getting them protected. And they, they, they were the one who introduced the place to, to the readers, who, who explained to them what are the issues there. And so that way I, I really felt confident that uh, I'd say the, the people who um, knew the place the best uh, would, would, would speak for them and say the right things. Because as photographers, I say, we, uh, we, 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 are, we are sometimes people who, who just come for a shoot, you know, we, some, some people work on, on very, very long-term projects and, and get to know places and their issues intimately, but, but man, many of us just come there for a project and leave, and so we are not necessarily in, in the best position to, to do this work of, um, of education, but uh, on the other hand, we can supply images to people who, who do that work. That's a great answer. And it leads me to something that I think is always on all of our minds. And Chris, I'll let you leave. Are, are we just doomed? Are we doomed or, or is, there, is there more positive happening? Is it, what, is, what is the most urgent and, and demanding project right now and, and what can we do to really well, Push first, I'm, I'm an optimist. I think um, evolution has gotten us several million years down the road, and uh, yes, uh, the plot is thickening, and, and certainly uh, we live during very serious times. But I see optimism uh, all over the world. I actually see space species being saved. I see wilderness areas being set aside. Uh, our foundation, Cultural Sanctuaries Foundation, was asked to come to Glasgow, the COP26, and we presented. And um, there's massive change beginning to unfold. The 30 by 30 initiative, 30% 30 of the planet saved by 2030. Those are some of the goals. Um, I'm seeing uh, the revitalization and uh, the renaissance of indigenous cultures happening all over the world. Young generations of um, highly traumatized indigenous cultures saying, wait a minute, our language is about to disappear, our, our cultural knowledge that is 10,000 generations of evolution, we're not gonna let it go. And so we're seeing programs, uh, remarkable programs all over the world um, uh, really happening. So I'm optimistic, I'm very optimistic. Um, we've got a, a global initiative where we're helping out indigenous filmmakers and storytellers and photographers. You know, they've been telling stories for thousands of generations. So uh, we're invited, we give them cameras and, and video cameras and let them tell their stories. So yes, I'm optimistic, but John Kerry, who is the US um, sort of ambassador of conservation for the United States, uh, said to a group of us in Glasgow, we'll get this done, but will we get it done in time? That is extremely, well put. And in a, in a similar range of topic, obviously, that's we're inundated with, well, 
everything's going to end, two degrees Celsius. There are so many doomsday kind of things. And, and even in a lot of what you read about indigenous people and the globalization, I feel like where I've had the most inspiration to inspire change or to, to try something there myself has been when it focuses on, sure, there are problems, but it focuses on the resilience of the people. Yes. And, and I think that this is something that's very important. And I, and I think maybe in the beginning, you, you really want to capture those images that are heartbreaking because you want to grab people. But you very quickly can lose people there, too. And despite all of the troubles and, and all of these things, there always are positive ways. There is a resilience. There is a beauty to share there. And Daniel, do, do you feel that way when, when you were documenting recently? You were trying to, is that what you were trying to do? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, actually, I want to make a few examples uh, how people uh, they actually appreciate that. Like last year, I made a project, uh, Prince for the Planet. So we donated part of uh, uh, the income to uh, tree plantation. Mm -hmm. And also on behalf of uh, Yuri Biligursky, he's not here, unfortunately, <coughs> he's in Iceland. They just accomplished the uh, Metascapes project. And uh, last week, they bought to plant uh, 59,000 uh, trees in Iceland. So this is the idea. You can turn this uh, large uh, following uh, into something uh, beautiful for nature, something useful. And most essentially, this is the feedback from people. So people are ready to support these good causes. So I think that's something I'll be looking uh, forward to in the future, trying to convert all this social media and following into the help of the na to the nature, giving back to the nature. This will be my personal goal for this year and uh, next few years as well. Oh, that's also a perfect segue into my next question. Uh, thanks. You guys are doing great by that, by the way. We're talking a little bit about the future, and, and, and you're right. So when you're taking on these projects and you have a, a, an audience, the idea is to lead from the front, and, and that's what you're doing. You're, you're showing people that you can do this, they can be a part of it, here's what they can do, and then we're hoping that as that community grows, more people will sort of follow in your footsteps and, and take those actions. So that's, that's a fantastic, fantastic view. And with everything that we have going on, I know that I'm, I have this, this problem where I'm always having to research the next project while I'm working on one. You know, we, we always have, you know, our eyes are bigger than the plate, as they say. But Jord, what, what's on the agenda now? What, what is your next goal with photography or the next project you're going for? Um, well, there are like two parts to my business, one, one being the photography side of things and my passion projects, the other um, being the education side of my business, so you know, trying to teach people how to take captivating, I guess, travel images, and the other part of that being how to build a sustainable, profitable business through your art, which is fortunately managed by my partner, Safe. Um, so I don't have to worry about that so much anymore, so I'm all about the passion projects, but um, I've gone really quite down the rabbit hole on agricultural life and work and, you know, perhaps looking at how, I guess, how to present Bali in a more sustainable way, right, as opposed to how it was, how it was shown and how it was travelled uh, prior to the pandemic. But I, I think going forward, I, I can see myself going further down the rabbit hole on perhaps agricultural work and, and in a sense... Um, manual labor work like throughout Indonesia and how people have shifted from tourism and hospitality work um, and returned to more traditional um, forms of work. So I already have a trip planned for, I'm returning to Indonesia in March um, and I'll, I'll be going to Java to document like mining and volcanoes um, as a starting point and then I guess I'll see yeah, <laughs> from there where I'm going to be taking it. That's great, that's great. QT, how about you? Well, you know, I, I've... <laughs> I've, I've started with the national parks, and uh, the, the, my, my second project is, is on the, was on the national monuments, which are, which are lesser known uh, lands. And uh, I'm, I'm thinking now about turning my eye to, to another system of public lands, which are called the national conservation lands in America, which are even more obscure. But uh, those, I, I like to work on those um, places because you know, they, they, are, they are places in the West, so they, they don't require me to, to travel that far. And then um, they, 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 they are a way for, 
for me to, to, to kind of work on my on, on lands which, 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 are, which are local to me, at least you know, places where, where I can drive to in a, in a reasonable amount of time, and places which are in the backyard of many people who are not aware of them. And so I think this is just the, the, uh, a step further in, in, um, in my evolution that's towards um, the more, um, more obscure lands and um, I would say trying again to, to, to raise awareness of them. So as we start to um, see the timer yelling at us on the top, this is, this is an important thing, and, and this is something I think about a lot when I'm teaching. It's not necessarily just advice for photographers who want to get into this, but sometimes we can come to events like this, and, and obviously the, these photos are amazing. We can read the stories. We can see the result of this work and this result of the impact. And when we're starting out, it can be hard. It can feel intimidating. You can feel like, what, what could I possibly do that could make a change? And everybody here, all of us here, we, we didn't start so that we could talk to you on stage about it later. We just took one step forward. And a, a quote that always stick with me is, if you can't do big things, do small things in a big way. And, and I feel like when you, when you want to make change, when you have the desire of intention, you just have to move forward, and it's always going to give you something positive. If, if you're doing this because it's something you want, you'll start to gravitate towards the media and the people that, that need to see it. And do you agree with this, Chris? I'd like to hear your perspective. Absolutely. And, you know, Ansel Adams once said to me, and I quote him often because he was a wise man, he said, uh, put off short-term gains for long-term goals. I think in an Instagram world, in an instant world, we want satisfaction now, we want results now. But if you believe in something, you believe in your photography, you believe in a project, it's well worthwhile. And I think you could ask Steve, who is here in the audience, or Steve McCurry, or Jim Nakway, or any anyone that's been in the field for a long time, they probably had years of uncertainty. They had personal projects that they worked on. And, and to this day, again, as Ansel Adams once said to me, you know, have your projects on the outside that pay the bills, but have your projects on the inside that are close to your heart. And just keep your eye on the long-term prize. That was a great answer. I, I feel, uh, I wish I would have been able to meet him. He sounds amazing. So, Daniel, what do you think? What would be your advice to someone who wants to either follow in your footsteps or make a change in the beginning? Well, I guess my main advice will be to bring the love and peace to, <laughs> to the nature, to the people. Especially, this is a very special day today. Happy Valentine. So <laughs> I take Valentine's a, day. also a chance to uh, congratulate <laughs> you guys for this beautiful day. And this is another reason just to say the world that uh, we love the nature and uh, inspire people to do so, to respect, save, and love what you're doing when you're outside. This is it. <laughs> That's great. QT, anything to add? Yeah, I would say that a, a good starting point is it's where you live. You know, you, 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 don't, you don't have to, to travel to the other end of the world to, to try to start to make a difference. And, and where you really want to make a difference is, is in, in your local community. So you can, so you, you that, that, that's the places that, that you can know the best. That's the places where you can, where you can return time and time again. Returning time and time again, that's, that's what help, that's what will help elevate your photography. Because for instance, in, in landscape photography, you, you will get familiar with the place, you will, you will know all its nuances, and then you will be able to, to interpret, it, interpret it better than anybody else because of that knowledge. And uh, so, we, the, each, each of us uh, lived near, near some, some places which, which uh, could, uh, could um, use a bit more love. And so, 
my, my advice is just to try, try to try to give those local places your your love and your, your attention and uh, see where it leads you. That's great, George. No pressure. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Um, probably a little difficult to add to all of that incredible advice, but um, I, th I think if there's anything that's come to me over the past um, 12 months, it would it would only be that for anybody you know, especially starting out, is maybe easy to be kind of focus on that, that end goal, but I think at the same time that can kind of be overwhelming in a sense, you know. Um, but I would just say to, for anybody that's starting out, like, you know, just don't wait for inspiration to come to you. Um, you know, you have to go and find it. That's right. That's right. Well, thank you, panelists. Thank you for reminding me it's Valentine's Day too. I'm gonna to have to make a call after this. <laughs> Thank you to the audience. I think that Thank you. Th this, was, this was great. Uh, you guys did, the, the answers are just very inspiring. And I just want to leave, since we're all kind of on the same page here, I want to leave you with one other quote that I love. And that's, wherever you go, go with all of your heart. Thank you. <laughs>